Let me just do one. And I, and I know I'm speaking while I'm trying to, while people are watching online and so forth. And so I'm, but I, I don't know what they do at home uh, or wherever they're watching from. But just one little word of encouragement here. <clears throat> and you know, you guys know, we, we very rarely, if ever, try to give some instructions to you about what you do as you worship or as you praise the Lord. I don't think anybody in here has ever been told you must do this or we want you to do that or you got to dance or you got to raise your hands or you got to do something in response to what the Lord's doing. But just one little word of encouragement and, and then I'm going to just move right on and this is just an encouragement to you. And same thing would be people at home where or wherever you're, you know, wherever you're watching this. You know, you might be limited if you're driving down the road, leave one hand on the wheel, you know, honestly. <laughs> And uh, don't close your eyes or anything like that. Uh, but if you're in the passenger seat, you can participate. Uh, one of the things, and I've, this goes in connection with an invitation to the Lord to, to, you know, Lord, I'm beckoning your presence. I want you to be here with me. When, you're, when you sing about things in the, in the words of what you're singing, when you say, my hands are lifted high in your presence. Your grace for me is always enough. If you lift your hands, then it's an act of, it's an act of Lord, my, I mean, I'm saying that my hands are lifted high, so I'm actually going to lift them high. And, it, it, and it's just a surrender. And I know, I know it. And listen, I'm not telling you you have to do it, so don't feel like, okay, I'm going to go to another church because now they're telling me i got to raise my hand. <laughs> And that's what those charismatics do. You know, for you Baptists, that means charismatics, you know. And I had a group of people tell me one time, that's charismatics. They didn't even know how to pronounce the word, yeah. The word charismatic looks like charismatic, if you look at it anyway. But, uh, but anyway, we're not a bunch of charismatics. But, but anyway, the, uh, the, uh, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to tell you you have to do this like, like you have to perform. It's not an issue of you have to perform. It's an issue of you uh, reflecting what you're saying. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. like I'm raising my hands or, I'm, or this is worthy of a shout. And, yeah. and, you know, a lot of times if you're in the congregation, you hear people, you know, I'm going to shout it out. And you start hearing while the music is going on that you hear people shouting. Yeah. You hear them saying, praise, glory, welcome Jesus, or, you know, stuff like that. And all that is is, okay, if I'm going to sing about it, I'm going to reflect it by what I do here, not just say words. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put myself doing this. Now, I'm just saying to you, if that feels a little awkward to you, if you will try, if you will do it, I believe the Lord will give you some freedom in your life. I believe that that will break some bondages that you, that you might have. And, and it, it may just be pride that keeps you from doing this because you're, you're, you care what people around you think about you. And if you raise your hand, then they're going to look funny at you. Well, that's nothing but pride. And so you need to break pride. It might, that, that right there might be the most releasing, not what you're saying and all that, but, but and not the notes you're writing down, but just simply uh, today in the service, you know what I did? I broke pride in my life, and I just did what the Lord asked me to do. And I don't know who this is for, but I felt compelled to say it. So anyway, whoever you are out there, I hope you will you know, have years to hear what the Spirit would say to you. I understand you because nobody is more prideful than me. And I'm, I'm confessing that as something that I fight against all the time. Uh, I know I don't seem like I'm a prideful person, but I must obviously be a prideful person because I really do care what people think. And I say I don't. If you ask me, I don't care what they think. And you might think that because of the way I act, that I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm like a bull in a china shop most of the time, you know. And, and it may seem like I say things and I don't care how you receive them. And I don't, you know, I'm not trying to hurt you, but, I, but I, I'm not limited by what I might say to you because of what you might think about it. But I'm, te I'm telling you from the inside out that I am a person that cares about what, you know, what you think about things. And I want to try to, you know, make them palatable and be gentle about them and not hurt you and all that kind of stuff. And it's just simply pride, and I have to fight against pride all the time. 
We all do. And I'm just saying, so as one, as one person, as somebody that didn't grow up releasing themselves, I grew up in a very strict traditional culture in church that you never did anything like that. Um, and I have to fight that. But I have found that when, when I will fight through that and release myself, that it does bring a release in my life that I'm searching for, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's worthy of the effort. Okay, yeah. so, all right, that's the end of that message. That has nothing to do with chapter 3 in the book of James, but let's just look, let's look in, the, in the book of James. Thank you very much. The book of James, uh, the wonderful book that tells us uh, a couple of things already in chapter 1, that Christians are people that can go through trouble and go through trials without giving up, without quitting on God. In chapter 2, Christians are people that practice what they preach. They don't just say things, they actually live the things that they say, and therefore their life reflects what they believe by what comes out of their life. And now in chapter 3, we're introduced to this wonderful little two-ounce muscular section of our body, uh, you know, this little mucous membrane muscle right here, you know, less than two ounces, a small thing compared to the size of our bodies, but so powerful is that it, that it just changes the course of nature. It's just, it does things that seemingly alter our entire life. And you know this. You know that there are things that you say sometimes that are just, so they just, they just are gigantic. Once you say them, maybe you're hot and you're hostile and you're frustrated and you're tired and you're, you've gone to the end of your limit and then all of a sudden, something comes out and it's just, it's bad, it's critical, it's harsh, it's ugly, it's, it's crude, it's rude, it's, yeah. And then you didn't mean to say it, and then you know, but you did, and then and now, and now your whole relationship has been altered, or your or your life has been altered by a tiny little second of something out of control, little little bitty part of your body. And James says, "Listen, this little fellow right here is tiny, but he's tough, and you gotta you, you gotta understand what what you what's going on with this little thing, so that." That if you can if if you can bring this under control, boy, you the rest of the Christian life is a piece of cake. Yeah. You know, this is the most difficult thing that you will have to deal with in your entire life. This right here is the tiny little part of your body, but it is tremendously powerful in life. And then James begins to tell us and compare and paint pictures of what this tongue is like. So in chapter 3, there are seven, there are seven pictures of the tongue and what the tongue is. And by these pictures, James is saying, okay, the tongue is this. So we look at this and see the characteristics of this and we can see what he's telling us the tongue is all about. So there's seven analogies, seven pictures of the tongue, and they're broken into three classifications. James says the tongue has the power to direct, which is what we looked at last week. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and put on the screen uh, first verse, uh, first uh, power to direct. Uh, the, the first verses, or first one, verse one and two are telling us that the, the tongue uh, has a tremendous power and a tremendous sway in our life and that by it we reflect uh, our whole nature and, and so forth. And then in verse three, he says, uh, indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that may, they may obey us and we turn their whole body. Uh, so James says that my tongue is like a horse with a, with a bridle, with a bit in his mouth. So um, the picture is of a wild animal. The picture is of a, of, a, of a raging stallion. The picture is of a beast that has its own will and its own mind, and it's, and it's out of control. It's powerful. It's muscular. It's strong. It's fast. It can do great things, but it's so out of control that it, it doesn't profit anyone because you can't Guide it in the direction you want to go, just like our tongue, guys. 
I, if, if our tongue is wild and reckless and, and, and can't be tamed and can't be pointed in a direction, our tongue is going to destroy our life and everybody else's life. And see, the bit in the horse's mouth, a bit, a normal bit, you've seen it, you've seen it, it goes through and it has a little curved part and that little curved part presses against the tongue uh, and when the, when the rider pulls on the reins, it causes this, this bit to press down harder and, and brings this beast, this wild beast under control so that the experienced rider can point this beast in any direction he wants and control the direction. And so James says the tongue has a tremendous power to direct our lives, just like a bit has a powerful direction for a wild animal because all of us are wild on the inside. All of us want to do our own thing on the inside. We are all driven by what we think, what we want, where we want to go, what's happening in our lives, and we're all self-centered and self-focused. And, 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 and so uh, the Holy Spirit has to fight against the us in us. Look at your neighbor and say, he fights against the you. <laughs> yeah, He fights against the you inside of you. And so James says, that, that the Holy Spirit is like a bit and it has to control the wild uh, forces that are on the inside of us. And then he says, uh, another picture is the picture of a ship in a rudder. Look also at the ships, although they're so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are tur turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. So now the second picture, it's not only a wild animal, now it's a giant ship with a, with a little tiny rudder, 1 60th most of the time, for what is considered fast ships, uh, the rudders are one sixtieth the size of the hull, almost uh, insignificant in comparison to the size of the ship and the tiny little size of the rudder. But that tiny little rudder, when the winds are blowing contrary to where the ship should go, uh, or the currents are carrying the ship contrary to the direction it should go, an experienced captain can turn the rudder and guide the ship out of destruction and, and go against the wind and go against the currents and, and point the ship in the right direction. So our tongue is like this. Our tongue has the power to direct lives that are out of control. Uh, we have forces on the inside of us that are pushing us to sin and to say evil things and to speak uh, non-godly things and to, and to do and to open our mouth and just spew out and, and vomit out uh, destruction and all of that. And, and, and so James says, so, so uh, the Holy Spirit, like a bridle, fights what comes from the inside of us that wants to do evil, and the Holy Spirit fights like a rudder on a ship those forces that come from the outside of us that want to push us to sin and rebel against God and go the wrong way and say the wrong things and do the wrong things and show up in the wrong places. So from the forces within and the forces without, the Holy Spirit tames the tongue in order that an experienced captain or an experienced writer can point our life in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. So two pictures, the power of the tongue to direct your life. Listen, you have the power to direct people's lives. You say yes, you say no, you say go this direction, you say take that class. The judge says guilty, judge says not guilty. Tiny words, but they control the whole life of people and give great direction in the midst of all these contrary forces that would drive all of us. We are all full of direction and wild direction from the inside of us because we have a sin nature that rebels against God at every hand. We always are pushed toward evil. The fight is to go toward God. And, and we're always, circumstances are always buffeting us and compelling us to move in this direction and to be swayed in that direction. And, and, and it is only the power of, of, of an experienced uh, captain, Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is at the helm of our boat, he's guiding the rudder and we'll go in the right direction. And so James says, 
Listen, don't underestimate the power of this tiny little thing in comparison to your body. Man, this is a tiny little thing, and whatever it does happens very quickly, just like that, and boy, it is so powerful. Now, he goes on to say second classification. Second classification is the power to destroy. So our tongue has the power to direct. Now our tongue, is our, who, is everybody all right? Is that, uh, somebody, oh, okay. I just wondered, all right. <laughs> Again, I'm killing you, all right, good. Um, all right, the power to destroy. The power to destroy. All right, our tongue not only has the power to direct, but it has the power to destroy. Can we get an amen? amen. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. If I, I would hate to ask you how many of your lives have been uh, destroyed in some way by somebody else's tongue. Yeah, yeah. And then I would say, well, how's, how's, how has your life been destroyed by your own tongue? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that too. All right, good, yeah. All right, so we know this is true. The tongue can destroy. And, and so James says, all right, let me show you some pictures of destructive things, and so you can see what I'm talking about when I say the tongue has the power to destroy. So the first thing James says is, all right, think of your tongue as a fire. Fire has the power to destroy things. Fire can quickly do things. Fire is, is, a, is a tremendous uh, obstacle in our life because it can happen so quickly. Let me just show you the verses. Next verses. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Yeah. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of, of nature and is set on fire by hell itself. Woo, why don't you tell us what you really think, James? Is that pretty, that's pretty provocative, right? I mean, that's pretty straightforward. He looks at you and he says, you know what your tongue is? Your tongue's like a fire. And it is set on fire of hell. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking about you now. Yeah, all right, he's talking about you. Yeah, that you have a tongue in your mouth that the, that, that the direction, that the, that the way this tongue operates is set on fire by hell itself. All right, so let's just see. What would he be saying to us? Uh, what would this picture of a fire be about? Well, let's just look at the characteristics of a fire, all right? I mean, that would be easy enough, right? He said our tongue is a fire, so what are the characteristics of a fire? Well, uh, one thing would be a fire always starts small, right? It starts with just a spark. Have any of you ever started a fire? Yeah, you start with what? A spark that lights a little piece of kindling that you put it on another little pile of kindlings and little combustible things. And then it goes and it begins to get bigger and then you pile bigger things. In, in, in other words, every, every fire starts with just a little bit of, of a spark. Yeah, yeah. So it starts small, but then it grows, right? It spreads. And then it becomes a gigantic thing, right? Yeah. I mean, look at California. Half of the state burns up every year because, of, because somebody's dragging a chain down the road and the little spark on the chain hits the grass on the side of the road. And before you know it... Uh, uh, you know, 25 miles is on fire, driven by strong winds, and it burns people's houses up, and burns cities down, and all that. But that started with a tiny little spark, the first thing that happened. The people in Colorado know that. The people in Nevada know that. I mean, these are, these are people, Arizona, the people of Arizona know this, that fires start small, but then they grow. So what would he be saying about our tongue? He would, say, he would be saying this, your tongue, might, it might be some tiny thing. It might be like an exaggeration here. Oh, she always does this. I never see him. He's never at his desk when I come in. 
And then a little small, uh, a little small misconception. You know, he's never at his desk when I come into the office. And you know, his secretary never at her desk when I come into the office. And so with a little tiny implication, a little tiny spark, now you've encouraged people to add two and two and get five because the, in, because the inf inference is, you know, they're in the closet somewhere having an affair. I mean, my Lord. And before you know it now, the whole office is talking about, you know, good gracious, did you hear about the affair that's going on, you know, between our boss and the secretary? When you didn't say that, you just implied some things. You just, you just encouraged somebody to believe something that's a misconception in life. I'm telling you, see, just a little spark. You just, you just, you just sparked a little spark, and it's going to burn somebody up. You heard about the ship's captain that every third day wrote in his captain's log, the first mate was sober today. <laughs> Do you know the first mate got fired by the shipping company? You know why? Because every third day, the captain wrote, the first mate was sober today, imp implying what? That on the second day and the next day, he was not sober. And it implied that this guy stayed drunk half the time. But he, he wasn't a drinker at all, and he wasn't drunk at all. He just happened to write every third day, the, the first mate was sober today. That, that's a spark, see? I'm, I, you see what I'm saying? And we can do that. And so James says, hey, you're... Tongue is like a fire, and one of the characteristics of fire is it starts small, just a spark. The, a second characteristic, I mean, I'm just kind of, you know, putting this out there for you to think about. A fire does what else? What is another characteristic about a fire? A fire heats things up, right? Whenever a fire starts burning, all of a sudden it starts getting hot where that fire is. Yeah, a hot heart and a hot head go together, right? Man, you get out of control, your anger bursts out, and you have a hot head, you're out of control, you know, and all of a sudden your mouth starts popping off hateful things and hurtful things. That's why the Bible says in the book of James, be slow to speak and quick to listen. That means you'll be slow to get angry about things because the more you talk, the more angry you become. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, James says if the prescription for getting angrier quicker is to quit talking and start listening. So when you pop off and pop, when you pop in, you pop off, you pop a, pop out, and then you pop a, in out of the room. You uh, you are going to create heat, and and it's going to it's going to begin things that you wish that you could. Take back, but these things can burn your life up. Now, you're going to regret it later, right? I mean, you were so angry. You were just out of control, and you just said stuff that you wish that you hadn't said, and you're going to regret it later. But, 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 but even though you can repent and, and say, I'm sorry, and I didn't mean to do that, and, and please forgive me, and all that kind of stuff, even though you can say that, you can't take back what you said. And what you said is going to continue. It, it would be like this. It would be like if you took a feather pillow and you went and you tore the pillow out and you took a feather out and you put it at your neighbor's door and then you went next door, took a feather, put it at the neighbor's door, went next door, put it at the neighbor's door, feather, took it, put it at the neighbor's door. And by the time you had taken all of the feathers and all of this pillow and placed them one at a time at each neighbor's door, uh, it would be like somehow you would be able to go back and regather all of those feathers and put them back in the pillow. Could you do that? No, because who knows where they've blown? Who knows where they've gone? I mean, the job would be boo. So what I'm saying is no matter how much you want to take it back and no matter how much you're saying you didn't mean it, you have started something that cannot be stopped. You have heated things up in light. So angry, hot words can be, can be rude, right? When you're angry and hot, you can spew out rude words. Oh, yeah, my goodness. I just say what's honest. I mean, you've heard people do this before. Man, I just say what I, I just say. I just tell the truth. I just say, yeah, I just say what's honest, yeah? And, you, and, 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 and you're rude and you're arrogant and you, you know, and you hurt people's feelings. And we're supposed to admire you 
because you somehow tell the truth. I mean, that's kind of the standard. You can be crude whenever you're angry and hot. Words can be hurtful and, 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 can, and can just uh, uh, bend your life and, and hurt the people that are next to you. It's like the old farmer, you know, he's, he comes home in the buckboard with his mules and his wife looks out and says, baby, you went to town today, why are you so late? And he said, well, uh, I had to pick up the preacher about halfway back home and from that point on, these mules never understood a word I said. Uh, you know, <laughs> hot, hot word, you'll get that tomorrow. Hot, <laughs> I'm just saying that, I'm just saying that's how, that's how hot words are, right? How many of you have, and don't raise your hands, this is rhetorical. How many of you have, have talked crudely when you got mad? I mean, no, I, yeah, I mean, you've said stuff that you would not normally say, right? And as a matter of fact, I would just, I would just pretty much guess that you said things that you're ashamed of. You've said things and you thought, oh my goodness, how wicked am I? You know, I thought I was past all of that. But anyway, so fire, fire starts small and, and then it grows. Fire heats things up. Uh, fire defiles. Think about that. Uh, if any of you have ever had something that burned down or burned some that you were responsible for, I can just about guarantee that you had as much damage from the smoke and the water it took to put it out as you did from the fire itself. The damage is, you know, trying to control the thing. Um, you know, it, it, caused, it caused more destruction than the fire caused. So slander and ridicule and being sarcastic um, are, are ways of communicating with this little tongue that actually what you imply does more damage than what you say, you know? Especially sarcasm. Man, listen, let me just give you one little tiny word. Please don't use sarcasm against anyone. That is the most hurtful, painful thing that you can do. I'm serious because it implies not only that they're wrong, but they're stupid and that they're ridiculous and that they, they're, they're to be, not to be taken seriously. You know, I, mean, I mean, just you know, stay away. But, but these are characteristics of, the, of fire. Fire, just, fire can, can be destructive in, in lots of ways that we don't anticipate. It's not just the word. It's not just the fire. It's what the fire causes and the damage it causes. Fire burns and hurts. One of the greatest things that Jesus suffered on the earth, as far as I am concerned, is some of the things that people said about him. Some of the most hurtful things that Jesus suffered, according to some of his own testimony, are the are the words that people said about him or to him while he was here on this earth. I'm just, I, I'm just saying fire hurts you. One of the characteristics of fire is that it hurts. It burns. When people say things about you, it hurts. It burns. When Jesus ate ate with, with sinners, and when Jesus uh, uh, showed up at their weddings and stuff like that, uh, the, everybody said, he's the friend of sinners. As a matter of fact, that was one of the messages that was on the sign where on the cross is that Jesus was a friend of sinners. He was a wine bibber and a gluttonous person. That's what they said about Jesus. And when Jesus performed miracles, you know what they said? He does this by the power of Beelzebub. He does this by the power of the devil. That's what they said about Jesus. And while he was hanging on the cross, they called him a folk. And, I mean, a fake and a phony and a and 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 and, and a, a person uh, that wasn't what he said he was, you know. And they and they just ridiculed him and and called him a fraud while he was there on the cross. So cruel and tactless criticism destroys and it burns and it hurts like fire. If you have to correct somebody, you know, there's a time in everybody's life where you might have to direct someone. You might have to say something that is contrary to somebody's direction, or you might have to give them some leadership, or you might have to say something that changes their direction. So in connection with those words, let me give you just four little things to think about, all right? I'm just going to say them now. Anytime you need to try to direct somebody's life or give them a little... 
uh, movement and you're going to have to maybe be a little negative about things, here, here are the four considerations just quickly. I didn't write them in your notes, but I'll try to say them. Uh, you know, the unpleasant truth has to be told. Four common sense questions for that situation. Number one, is, it, is what I'm about to say absolutely true? Is it absolutely true what I'm about to say? Or is it just something I think? Is it just a speculation? Is it a rumor I heard? Or is what I'm about to say absolutely true? And then secondly, is it absolutely necessary to tell it? Not only to tell it, but to tell it to this audience at this time under these circumstances. Is it absolutely true? Is it absolutely necessary to tell it to these people in this situation, in these circumstances, at this time? And then number three, is it fair to everybody that's concerned? And number four, are my motives pure in telling it? And if it can pass those four tests, then let it rip. <laughs> but if not, it's... Uh, it's one of those painful, hurtful things. And then fire spreads. Uh, the more fuel you give fire, the faster it'll spread. As a matter of fact, verse 6 says, look up here, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and it sets on fire the course of nature. It sets on fire the course of nature, which means it sets the course of my whole life on fire. Is what it literally says. It, it, really, it really can burn me up. The word picture here is the picture of a giant wooden, wooden wheel, like on a chariot. How many of you have seen the movie Ben-Hur or some of these old Roman movies, you know, about Roman Empire and all that kind of stuff, and they have these chariot races and stuff like that, and you're watching these chariots, and these chariots have wooden wheels, and they have, like, they have a hub, and then they have wooden spokes that go out from the hub, and then they have a wooden circumference around it. Well, that's the word picture here that James is using. He's saying, you know, life is, your life is fit together like a wheel. It has a hub, and it has spokes that go out, and it has a rim, and they are all interconnected with each other. So your life is all interconnected with itself. In other words, you can't burn the hub without affecting the, the spokes. You can't burn the spokes without affecting the hub and the outside. In other words, our whole life is fit together like this. And so what James says is that our tongue can be, can, can be like a fire that starts burning at the hub and then burns out to the spokes and then burns out to the rim. And before you know it, uh, our whole life is destroyed because our whole life fits together. Hey, is this, I mean, is this making sense to you? I mean, you say the tongue is a fire. What does that mean? Well, it means all of those things. It means it, it, means it starts with a spark. It means it burns and hurts. It means it destroys and defiles. It means, it means it can consume a life. It's very destructive. It can, it can change the whole direction of your life, and it is set on fire by hell. When I let this tongue get out of control, it's like an unruly fire. Listen, fire under control is our friend, right? Man, think about how fire helps us. Fire has changed the whole nature of humanity. To bring fire under control means it can heat, it can light, you know, it can power. I mean, it's a wonderful friend when it's under control, but when it's out of control, it's destructive and it destroys our life. So James says, hey, whew, we got to get this thing under control. And, and, and then he's going to go on to say, well, you'll see in the next verse, he said, uh, uh, for every kind of beast and bird and of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. He's right, isn't he? No man can control this tongue. Huh? How many of you have been fighting? And don't answer it, please. This is rhetorical. How many of you have been fighting a losing battle trying to control your tongue? Just when you thought you had it, it popped up on you again, right? And it disappointed you because you said, man, I've got this thing. I thought I was further along than this. I thought I could handle this. I, ooh, look at what my whole life is full of. I thought I had dealt with that. 
And then all of a sudden, it pops out of you as a testimony that this is going to be a fight that you face all of your life. So James says, don't expect some man to be able to control this tongue. He didn't say the tongue couldn't be controlled. He just said, you can't control it. What that means is that it has to be controlled by something greater than you. And that means Jesus can control your tongue. God can control your tongue. The Holy Spirit can control your tongue. But you must surrender your tongue to him. Now, I know that's going to be a little bit difficult. I heard of a lady one day that came to her pastor, and she said, Pastor, I've been convicted about my tongue. She said, my tongue just wags all the time. I'm the biggest gossip in town, have been for years and years and years, and I've tried to commit my tongue to the Lord so many times and be forgiven. And uh, and, and the pastor knew she wasn't sincere because this was about the 10th time she had come down and testified of the same thing. And so he looked at her, and he said, and she said, I want to lay my tongue on the altar, God. And he said, ma'am, that's impossible. She said, what? He said, well, our altar's only 20 feet long. I mean, come on. Uh Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. There you go. There you go. I'm just saying to you, you can't lay it on the altar. The Holy Spirit has to control this old wild, fiery thing that is so easily set on fire and so hurtful and so powerful to destroy somebody's life, just like a fire is so consuming and so hazardous when it's out of control. It doesn't help us. It hurts us. It burns us. It destroys things. And then he goes, and I know I ran through it, and I'm just going to run back. He said, here's the third picture or the fourth picture. It's a dangerous animal. The tongue is like a dangerous animal. Uh, would, would I bring into this congregation today, would I, would I bring a, a wild animal? Would I turn loose a, a lion or a tiger or a bear? I put it in, you know, put it in your notes of lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my, lions and tigers. <laughs> the Wizard of Oz. I tell you, I don't quote from Shakespeare. So I quote from the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> But, yeah, what it, I mean, would, would, we, would we bring a, a wild lion in here and just say, let it loose? No, why? It would kill everybody in here or most everybody in here. Or if we brought a wild tiger or a, a crocodile or an elephant or anything that was wild, that was out of control? No, no, no. So the tongue is like a, an animal, wild animal that has not been tamed. And it says men have tamed a lot of things and men have tamed a lot of things, but they're still wild. I mean, uh, uh, back in about 2003, I know it doesn't seem that long ago, Siegfried and Roy had, you know, for 30 years, they had these white lions and white tigers, and they had performed with them in Las Vegas, one of the biggest acts in Las Vegas. And all of a sudden, Roy goes out there, and he's getting with his, that white tiger that he's been thousands of times. He's been with the tiger, and he's directed the tiger and, and all of that. And all of a sudden, just out of the blue, the thing bites his head and starts chewing on him and all of that kind of stuff. And would have killed him if they wouldn't have drug him out of there. Why, why did that happen? Because that thing is wild. No matter whether you think it's under control, it could turn wild at any second. And that's what happens to it. So, you know, we've tamed, so to speak, many things, but... James says the tongue is like a wild animal. It's dangerous because it can just pop out at any time. And then he says it's like a poison. What, does, what is he talking about, a poison? Well, what are the characteristics of poison? We, we've learned some things about poison. We have, we have deadly poisons that we've heard about in the last few years thanks to terrorism. We've heard about the most deadly poison in the world, botulin toxin. Botulin toxin, it takes like a tiny drop. I, I put it in your notes. I think like, you know, one fiftieth of a gram or whatever, one little tiny speck to kill 14,000 people. I mean, this is so deadly that, you know, you, you I mean, it, it's unbelievable deadly. It takes a tiny little drop. What is that saying? It only takes a tiny little drop of your tongue to kill something, to just destroy lots of things. So here's the point. Poisons are are deadly. Wild animals are deadly. Fire is deadly. But if, if we can tame those things, if we can turn those things over to God, the Holy Spirit can tame those things so that 
that fiery tongue can become a helper and not a herder. A helper, when it's under control, it warms, it lights, it fuels, it, it, it blesses our life. It becomes a light into our feet rather than burning up our path. If, if, if the animal is under control, they can become helpers rather than herders, like elephants that can move giant loads or camels that can walk across a desert or a wild animal that can be taught to pull a plow or to give help or aid, see? When it's under control, it's our friend. When it's out of control, it kills our life. Our deadly poison, man, cancer treatments that some of you have undertaken, all that is is poison being put in your body under a controlled condition. It kills cells in your body, hopefully not a bunch of good ones and a whole bunch of bad ones, but it is nothing but poison being introduced into your body a little tiny bit at a time. And it becomes a helper rather than a herder in life. And James says that our tongue is like that, out of control. It messes, it destroys lives. But under the Holy Spirit's guidance, it becomes a great friend. So the tongue has the power to direct. The tongue has the power to destroy. And one other thing, just really quickly, all right? The power has the tongue to delight. Yeah, the power has the tongue to bring greatness and bring help into our life. You know, we're such a bundle of contradictions, aren't we? Yeah, we're, we're such, a, as humans, we, we are such a bundle of contradictions. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Romans 7. You, you, you'll identify with this. Let's see if you'll identify with what Paul says about how contradictory our lives are. The Apostle Paul said, um, you know the thing I can't understand about myself? Reach Romans 7, you'll see. You know, you know, you know what, what I don't understand about my life? What I don't understand about my life is I don't understand why I do what I do. He said, when I want to do good, I can't do good. When I, want, when I don't want to do bad, somehow I can't keep from doing bad. So I... I don't do what I want, and I, and, and I do what I don't want to. And then, he, and then he says this. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who can save me from this body of death? And then he says, thanks be to our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, only Jesus Christ can save me from the contradiction I am. And that's pretty much true about all of us. We wrestle with that. We wrestle with doing what we should do and not doing what we should not do. And so uh, James basically in the contradiction section of life says, you know what, tongue, the tongue can be a fire, the tongue can be a poison, the tongue can be a wild animal, the tongue can direct, the tongue can be great things, and it can also be bad things. But uh, 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 one, of the thing, one of the other uh, parts of the tongue is the tongue can be very productive in our life. and I mean, it, it, it's a fountain, he says. Verse 9, with it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing, my brethren. These things ought not be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter water from the same opening? So, so James is saying, um, we are full of contradictions, and in no place in our life is it more evident than in the way our tongue works. He said, we get up on Sunday morning, our praise team gets up here and leads us in worship and praise and adoration to the Spirit of God. And when our mouth just sings forth praise and we love the Lord and we bless the Lord and we call on the Lord and we love the Lord and, we, and in church on Sunday morning, we bless the Lord and we praise the Lord. And then on our way home, we have barbecue preacher for lunch. Barbecue worshiper, barbecue uh, uh, security personnel, barbecue, you know, uh, uh, visitor welker, you know, anybody, just choose your, choose your man, choose your woman, hey, barbecue them. And you know what that does? It's so foolish because what it does is it removes that person from being a helpful influence in your life, right? I mean, look, one of these days, and I'm just speaking just straight out to you now, okay? One of these days you might need me. One of these days I might need to talk to your child to get off a of crack. 
One of these days, I might be the person who's going to speak to somebody about their marriage and, and, and how to get it back right. I mean, I might be the very one that goes to a hospital and, and, and they're going to need my encouragement to have faith that God's going to heal them. But if you have destroyed me in their presence by speaking evil about me rather than greatness about me, you have eliminated me, the very one that you need, from being that instrument of help in your life that God has intended for me to be. Or anyone else, not just me, anyone else. It might be that person sitting beside you that you need, but you can't destroy them with this crazy tongue. You can't bless God on Sunday morning and then curse people and ridicule people and talk about people uh, and then expect them to be able to be used as blessings in your life. He said there, 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 there are no... There, uh, uh, he was talking to a group of people that were regional people, and I, I know, you know, just historically, and I'm, I'm hurrying, but the, he, he was speaking to people who knew what he was talking about, about this thing of a, of a, of a good fountain and a, a, a clear fountain and a salty fountain. And, and, and this is what the picture was. He said, you know, in the, in the plain where the Jordan River runs down between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, Geographically, the, the, the Jordan River runs between the, the Sea of Galilee up here and the Dead Sea right here. The Dead Sea being the lowest spot on earth, salty. No, you, you can't even sink in that salt water. Seriously, if you went out there and you just lay down on the water in the Dead Sea, you couldn't even go under the water. The water's so thick and salty, you, you, it, it, it's booing. It won't, you can't dive. It just keeps you up like that. And, it, and it, it's no life. It's full of salt. And so on the way down, the Jordan River has cut a path. And so if you look at the, some of the hills, you might see on a hill a, a, a beautiful fountain, a beautiful cave. And, it, and, and out of that cave is running this crystal clear, beautiful looking, sparkling, cool water. And when you go up to it and you take a little taste, oh, it's fresh, it's clean, it's life-giving, it's awesome. And then right beside it is another cave, and the water coming out of it looks just the same. It, it, it's crystal clear. It's, it's awesome. But then you stick your hand up, and it's so soft. It's like, ooh, man, this, it's death. Well, James says, we have a hole in our head. And this hole in our head spews out stuff. Just like you have a hole in the side of a mountain and out of it comes either fresh water or salty water. Choose your choice, one or the other. But one thing you never see in nature is you never see. You can see a crystal clear stream right here and right next to it, another crystal stream. They look exactly the same. You couldn't tell the difference by looking, but one of them has fresh water and one of them has salty water. But what you'll never see in nature is a stream where there is only one stream and it sometimes runs salty and it sometimes runs fresh. You never see one that has both salt water and fresh water coming out of the same stream. So James says, that's your tongue. So it has the power to delight. It has the power to give life and to, and, and to be wonderful and to praise the Lord and it gives you the ability to do great things. But, 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 you, but it has to be under control uh, by the Spirit of God in order to do that. Now, let me show you, the last few verses here um, is, uh, uh, it seems like it's about a whole different subject, but I want you to just look at the last paragraph that I wrote in your notes, okay? And I'm just going to read it to you. In your notes, that last paragraph down here, the bell and the clapper, I'm going to read the verses and then read that to you and we're finished. All right, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. What in the world is, is that talking about? That's talking about somebody who is led by the Spirit of God and who is able to, uh, to speak wise and to have humility that you can trust that kind of a person and that person can do great things in your life. But if that person exists, he exists because his life is filled with the wisdom of God. That's what that means. Is there anybody that says wise things and speaks good things? And Just know that that person is under the control of the Holy Spirit. That's how he does that. 
But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Let me go on and sit here. All right. Uh-oh. I've done something. There it is. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. So he says, all right, just know this, that if your life is confused, if your life is envious, envious, in other words, you, you, you seek, you have ill will against somebody who has more than you, against somebody that has better than you, somebody that you look at as being superior in your life, you are ill will toward them, you want what they have and you hate their guts, you know, kind of thing. And you really want something bad to happen to them and don't sit there looking like an angel because I know you have thoughts like this, like that old wicked person next door, they never darken the door of the church. They never talk about God. They're just crude, rude, irreverent and all that. And it seems like good stuff happens to them. And man, I can't stand them. And I wish, I wish God would judge them and blah, blah, blah. And why do they always get good stuff? They don't love the Lord. I mean, that's, that's envy. That's envy. Uh, you want what they have, and you hope they get crashed down. How many of you remember playing King of the Hill when you were growing up? <laughs> you remember that? A little game called King of the Hill? What was that? That was a game where there was somebody that was the King of the Hill, and everybody else tried to knock that person off of the hill so that they could then become King of the Hill. Well, you're, in envy, you're hoping that circumstances will knock them off the hill. But if circumstances won't knock them off the hill, you're willing to help circumstances just a little bit. <laughs> and, 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 with, and, with a, and, the, and the and with a little word, you can you can you can help, help knock them off of their high horse. Oh, she's mighty pretty, don't you agree? Yeah. Well, if I had all the makeup on she had on, I mean. I mean <laughs> He doesn't need to be on that committee anymore. Oh, no, no, no. He's brilliant. He's smart. But he's so aggressive. Nobody can get a word in edgewise. You know? Yeah. Yeah. We need to get rid of them. Oh, they're a great singer. They're wonderful. They're beautiful. But we don't need them in the praise team anymore because they're so loud. You know, you just can't get. Yeah. Envy. Strife. Division. He says, where there's envy and strife, there's all kind of evil, and there's just there's no end to it. And so only under the leadership of the Holy Spirit can things be changed from that. And so he's saying, look, um, if there is envy and strife, there's going to be all kinds of evil there. I mean, think about this. Your tongue can commit every kind of sin known to mankind. I mean, you can kill somebody with it. You can, you can maim somebody with it. You can hurt somebody with it. You can lie with it. You can covet with it. You know, you can dishonor your parents with it. You can dishonor God with it. Just think of a commandment. You can do it with your tongue. See, this is a powerful little dude. I mean, I know I'm preaching to the choir because I know you're aware of this, right? I'm just trying to say to you that the Holy Spirit is, has to control it or you're sunk. So there you go, verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, then willing to yield. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it works with you. It's, a, it's something that's, uh, that's not a rivalry thing. It's full of mercy, so it has a forgiving nature about it and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. It doesn't take sides. It doesn't have play favorites and so forth. Now, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And that's the end of chapter 3. Let me read you this little paragraph right here, okay? The last little paragraph. Shakespeare, who had something to say about almost everything, made this statement concerning the tongue. He hath a heart as sound as a bell, and his tongue is the clapper for what the heart thinks, the tongue speaks. I also love the way Jesus states it out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This closing section of chapter 3 exposes this truth. To rightfully use the tongue, the heart, and the mind need to be conditioned with the wisdom of God. As children of God, we are peacemakers. May I say that again? As children of God, we are peacemakers. Look at your name and say, you're a peacemaker. You remember the beatitude, right? You remember the beatitude in Matthew? Blessed are the... Well, you're saying meek, but I'm looking for the word peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. 
In other words, God said, you want to be called one of mine? You want to reflect me as your father? Be a peacemaker. Not a peace lover. No, no, I'm sure all of us would say we love peace. We want to be at peace. We don't like confusion and destruction. And we love peace, but he didn't say, blessed are the peace lovers. He said, blessed are the peace makers. That means I'm actively attempting to make peace and to bring peace. That's when I become a child of God. That's when I look like my heavenly father. So as children of God, we are peacemakers. We are God's instrument of peace in this world. Think about this. The way we express what we are is by the way we speak. If we are to be delightful instruments of God, we must allow the wisdom of God to control our heart and mind so that the message on our tongue can be God's message and not ours. <laughs> the implication is not ours. That's a big task, isn't it? Do you know I think this is the kind of task we'll be fighting the rest of our life? Do you think this? And just when you think you got the little booger under control... Here it comes. That's why our life continually has to be surrendered to the Holy Spirit, so continually surrendered to the heart of God and the mind of God and the peace of God. And remember, when we talk, we are to make peace. We are to be God's instrument. And, and that deadly poison and that wildfire and that, and that untamed animal uh, is intended to be under the control of, then it becomes a friend and not a destroyer in life. And it can be a delightful thing and bring refreshing, wonderful, cleansing, refreshing water. Uh, it can bring an awesome uh, a bounty of figs. You know, a, a, a fig tree doesn't bear grapes. It bears figs. Yeah, right. So that's just saying your life bears what it really is. Oh, my goodness. Look at your neighbor and say, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> you don't see a... You don't see a a fig tree bearing grapes or a grapevine bearing figs. No, if you got figs hanging on you, you a fig tree, okay? You can say I'm a vine, but no, you a fig tree. I'm telling you. Because <laughs> you don't see fig trees growing grapes. All right, I think you got it. Did you get what James was saying? Is James brilliant led by the Spirit of God? My goodness, that is such a case, isn't it? Oh, my goodness. Wait till you get to chapter 4, which starts next week. All right, let's go. <laughs>